Hello audience, Mr. Z here. The Second Boer War is a bit like the War of 1812. It's often overlooked, had a wide variety of names, and determined the continued independence of a nation from Britain. For the Boers, however, they were not as fortunate as we Americans were, as you can see from the lack of a Boer state in Africa today, but we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves. Firstly, who are the Boers, and what were the Boer Wars? The word Boer is one of Dutch origin and means farmer. The title is commonly attributed to descendants of settlers in the Dutch Cape Colony, which would grow into what we'd recognize as South Africa today. In the early 1800s, the land was acquired by the United Kingdom and achieved self-governance in 1872. By this point in time, Britain had done its part to Angloize the region, but throughout those years, the Boers had largely resisted British influence, something the Brits didn't tolerate all too well, initiating a period of hostilities between the Boers and the Brits. Now, while some Boers fought British assimilation on their home front, others saw greener pastures, quite literally since they were farmers. This migration of the Boers further into Africa became known as the Great Trek, and led to the establishment of the Orange Free State and South African Republic. For many of the Boers, the existence of these two independent states brought them enough comfort to finally accept British rule in the Cape Colony. Britain, however, then made horrible mistake number two, attempting to conquer the two independent Boer states which had finally brought them cooperation. You see, Britain was happy to allow these subjects of its colonies to leave for uncharted lands because it saw them as pioneers, not rightly in a respectable way, but in a sense that they could do the hard work of clearing the ground before a British population moved in and took the land for itself. Why did Britain do this exactly? Well, if they didn't, someone else might have. Like Belgium, or Portugal, maybe even Germany. The scramble for Africa had just kicked off around this time, making Britain scramble as well, especially for those easy lands which, in its own eyes, it already held claims to. So Britain takes over the Cape Colony, the Boers are unhappy. The Boers are unhappy, they move away. They move away, create their own countries. Britain also attempts to take those countries, and now we have the First Boer War. Now the First Boer War, of course, came to favor of the Boers, who exploited guerrilla tactics and had a home field advantage against the poorly camouflaged British infantry. Although critical analysis of both sides' capabilities would indicate that despite the Boer victory, British forces held an overwhelming advantage in skill, number, and ability, as despite common belief, British soldiers in Africa were more than familiar with the terrain and had become used to training in such conditions. The British downfall came from poor strategy and communication between leadership, grossly underestimating the preparedness of the Boers and delaying to relay such information. Only a few years later, and Britain would have learned from its mistakes as the Second Boer War broke out, beginning as a result of Boer interaction with Imperial colonies against British interests and as a large deposit of gold was discovered in the region. The conflict was perhaps also in part instigated by Cape Colony Prime Minister at the time Cecil Rhodes, who envisioned the whole of Africa as a British domain and saw the two Boer Republics as standing in the way of that. A British raid was launched against the South African Boer Republic, only to be repelled. Tensions would rise between Britain and the Boer states again, primarily for the Boers' denial of voting rights to British nationals within their own nations, clearly doing so because they feared pro-British agents subverting their government and handing the nations over to the Empire. Attempts to mediate conflicts failed and war broke out. Britain initially stumbling along the same stones as the First Boer War, however later gaining the upper hand, defeating the Boers and annexing both states into the Union of South Africa. But what if that changed? What if against astronomical odds the Boers somehow managed to repel the British and secure their independence? Perhaps the Boers could direct their offensive toward capturing Cape Colony, which still bore a population of, uh, Boers. <laughs> Germany, who was sympathetic to the Boers and supported them in their previous efforts, could supply the Boer army with superior weaponry and perhaps minimally some support troops who could also train their soldiers, while also arming the Boers in Cape Colony to launch a revolt against their British occupiers. The conflict, potentially costing Britain the resources already held in the Cape and complicating trade with the area as a revolt raged, might be enough for Britain to withdraw itself from the independent states and attempt to negotiate a peace agreement with leaders of the Boer uprising. The Boers could negotiate for the secession of some land to create a third autonomous Boer Republic, but most likely the war would simply break even, Britain retaining its land and the Boers retaining theirs, since any land along their borders would most likely be a source of gold deposits which Britain would be very unlikely to part with. In 1902, peace is made, a large number of Cape Colony Boers migrate to the Orange Free State and South African Republic, 
In order to protect and contribute to what they consider the last bastions of their culture on the continent, British attempts to impose their will upon the Boers would have riled up a great deal of Boer nationalism and lead to this exodus of the population from the Cape to the Republics, increasing their numbers, adding more manpower to their national unit, and making the Boer nation stronger. The Boers being a relatively small nation in a very distant land with few allies would attempt to keep a neutral stance, but much like Ethiopia would become influenced by the powers around it. However, unlike Ethiopia, the Boer republics would hold a great anti-British bias, drawing them closer under the wing of Kaiser Wilhelm II of the German Empire, who saw a mutually beneficial alliance between their southwest African colony and the Boers. They, with their military history, provide protection to the colony, while Germany would route supplies, technology, and weaponry to the republics in exchange. The republics would also manage to negotiate following the war a trade pact with Portugal's colony of Mozambique, utilizing its ports to trade the republic's goods across the world. Being landlocked as they were, the republics would have become heavily dependent upon Portugal and Germany, the only other neighboring force being Britain, whose colonies almost completely surrounded them. Nor could Portugal be counted on in a time of crisis, as the Portuguese had a history with Britain and may support them in an embargo of their trade. Thus, the German Boer alliance would become primary and hold greater importance to the nation, this becoming exceedingly significant in the years to follow, as it would most certainly mean the involvement of the Boers in the Great War on the side of the Central Powers. One might suggest they remain neutral, but such a thing would endanger the alliance they've been so dependent on. Some might also suggest the Boers betray Germany and align with Britain for the sake of security, but this would go deeply against the sentiments of the Boers and would require either a state of sheer desperation or a lapse of judgment. Now, the impact of the Boers supporting the Central Powers is, well, relatively insignificant. In our timeline, the German colony's forces found themselves vastly outnumbered and quickly overtaken, though in this timeline, with the population reduction brought about by the Boer migration and the reversal of that very same force against Britain, this could open up a new front in South Africa, which would ultimately amount to a third Boer War, with the minor support of the Central Powers. Regardless of how long the Boers are able to hold off the British, they'd eventually be overwhelmed. If not by Britain alone, then certainly once the US became involved and freed up resources from Europe. The British would occupy the Boer Republics as they do with Germany's southwest colony and impose upon it penalties which, while unequal to those imposed on Germany, would generate basically the same conditions. Boer companies being cut off of trade with Portugal would go completely bankrupt and thus become subservient to Britain. Boer poverty would rise while the British became an untouchable upper class. The republics having grown significantly over the years in population would continually wage a guerrilla war against the British occupiers. These operations would primarily be led and carried out by Fritz du Kesne, a soldier with a deep history combating the British. Having fought in the Second Boer War, he was captured numerous times, always escaping British clutches, and even infiltrating their ranks to gather information for the Boers. After the Boers had lost in our timeline, Fritz had gone on to work for the Germans as a spy in World War I sabotaging British weapon shipments by planting explosives upon ships, only to be caught on one of these occasions by the US, where he would feign being paralyzed and escape once again when his captors had let their guards down. He'd be captured for a final time in 1941 when he was apprehended by the FBI for operating a German spy ring during World War II. In this timeline, Fritz, following the Second Boer War, becomes a political and military celebrity, going on to lead a freedom movement against Britain, similar to Ataturk's movement in Turkey. In 1925, Britain would concede to relinquish a reduced segment of Boer land to establish an independent Third Boer Republic. However, as expansionist moves by Germany, Italy, and Japan went unpunished, so did the Boers over the years under Fritz proceed to annex the whole of their old Republic land. Germany's invasion of Poland would inflame and destroy any illusions of maintaining peace for the Boers, and in a move to assert their absolute independence over Britain, would capture the eastern coasts of South Africa, so they would no longer remain a dependent, landlocked people. World War II breaks out, France is captured and occupied just as in our timeline, Italy pledges its allegiance to Germany's war effort, and so does the Boer Republic. Suddenly, Africa becomes a far more significant front in the war. Italy launches a failed push into British Egypt, while the Boers mount a sweeping invasion of the South African Cape, gaining much support from the pro-Afrikaner National Party, and retake Germany's old colony. Now, not too much has changed from our timeline, except that former British South Africa had essentially joined the Axis, and those resources would now be capped off. So considering that is the primary change in World War II, let's analyze this and determine if it would be enough to win the war for Germany.
So if we remove South Africa from the equation of Britain's war effort, we would cut off major shipping ports that would connect voyages from India and the Pacific toward Britain, thus forcing the empire to become heavily dependent upon the Suez Canal for what might become its sole means of shipping necessary fuel for the war machine. This would make the North African campaign far more important as a collapse in British supply shipments would cripple the nation, leaving it to potentially fight until starvation or surrender. Now, North Africa did heavily favor the Allies, as this was where Italy earned its infamous reputation as a failed military power during the Second World War. Italian forces, having been deployed in the manner they were, simply siphoned off resources from Germany's overseas campaign with Britain. The front wasn't taken as seriously as it should have been by Germany and grossly left Italy to its own devices, which proved a devastating move. Because in this timeline the Suez Canal and Africa become so crucial, Germany would likely provide more initial effort to simply neutralize Britain in a far off near inaccessible front. South African troops, though minor in number they may have been, were of major significance to Britain's North African air raids against Italian forces, as well as contributing to infantry divisions to a number of significant battles. If we were to, again, leverage these things against Britain instead, the odds are close, but it does become very possible for Germany to capture the Suez Canal from Britain, and thus starve Britain of resources, forcing a surrender. However, considering Churchill's never surrender policy, this might not immediately be the case. Many would remain loyal to Churchill, but as food, medical, and fuel shortages boomed, so might we begin to see unrest and mutiny grow within Britain. Sir Oswald Mosley may be sprung from his imprisonment and lead a coup against Churchill to bring peace to Britain and end the war. Unlikely to go quietly, we'd see the ignition of a mini-civil war within Britain, Mosley leading calls for peace with the support of exiled King Edward VIII to grant him legitimacy, while Churchill stood with the current order which was fracturing at the seams. British conflicts with Germany would come to a halt before a declaration of surrender was finally issued. India would utilize Britain's destabilization to declare independence and align itself with Germany for protection against a reconquest. British colonies in Africa are divided up by Germany, the Boer Republic, and Italy, as the resources acquired from Britain's defeat provide enough fuel for Germany to mount a push into the Soviet Union, who would ally itself with the US and the old British government in exile as Japan is slowly converged upon by the US and USSR. Germany is now more readily prepared to combat the Soviets, no longer facing a two-front war, while oil from North Africa keeps motors running as German tanks plow into Soviet territory. The Soviets put up a hefty fight as they did in our timeline, but without the strain Germany faced in our world, the spear of war is thrust deeper into Russia. With the Japanese defeated, the US would withdraw and call for peace with Germany. It is uncertain whether or not Germany would accept this, but let's say hypothetically this finally closes the door on conflicts. The Communists and the Soviet Union have essentially been eradicated and no longer pose a threat. European Russia will be broken off and the rest of the former Soviet Union divided up into weaker states, easily controlled by Germany. The Boers who begun this story for us would now have a homeland encompassing a greater swath of South Africa, including Madagascar. Here the Boers would create a rich society based upon trade, agriculture, and resource extraction, all of which would contribute greatly to making the Boer Republic one of the world's new great powers. And that is where I'll end this video for now. The US of Z thanks you for watching. Support your legion by liking the video or join our ranks by subscribing for more. This has been Mr. Z, out.